no, Wednesday is December 7th, the Pearl Harbor Day. And so we thought this would be uh, the perfect week for this subject matter. Um, we originally were going to have this in October, but Hurricane Matthew um, changed our plans. So this was the perfect week to reschedule with Jerry. So I want to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Jerry McLaughlin is a native of Queens, New York, and was raised on Long Island, where he graduated from Long Island University with a degree in U.S. History. He served in the United States Army from 1969 to 1971 and was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, before he embarked on a 30-year career with the federal government. Jerry retired from the Central Intelligence Agency in 2003 as a member of that organization's Senior Intelligence Service. And I was going to comment that I bet he has juicy stories, and he just gave me a little juicy story, so um, <laughs> I'm sure he's got even better ones, though. Um, in 2004, Jerry and his lovely wife, Denise, who's joining us in the corner, retired to Savannah, and they now live on Skidaway Island with their rescue terrier, Annie. And um, with retirement, retirement um, that allowed Jerry to return to that early history degree. And in 2005, he began his volunteer service with the National Museum of the Mighty Eighth Air Force as an archivist. Uh, along with two colleagues, he received the Schuler Award for Museum Service in 2007 for their efforts in reorganizing the museum archives. He was selected as the project manager for the B-17 City of Savannah restoration at the project's inception in January 2009 and held that position until the dedication of the airplane in January 2015. Jerry recently authored the book B-17 Flying Fortress Restoration, which chronicles this six-year project. And he's here to share that story with us today. So Jerry, let me turn it over to you. Okay. I, it, it's so interesting to see people here that are really employees of the city of Savannah. I've been wearing t-shirts and shirts like this and, and sweatshirts for the last eight years and it says City of Savannah on it. People go, oh, you work for the city, what do you do? And I got to go through the whole litany of, no, no, it's a volunteer project and it's, a, it's an airplane. Um, so here's some real City of Savannah people. And um, one of the uh, things that I would like to, for you to do is when you come out of this, if you'll like be an ambassador for the airplane. I mean, everybody that comes through and, and stops at the, at the museum, they see the city of Savannah. And um, I'm going to tell you some stories today. Um, people go out there and they see this big metal airplane. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a bomber and everything. But no, 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 it's got a thousand stories. And they all re relate in some way or another to the city. And as I said, if you could become ambassadors for the stories that I'll tell you today, you can say, that's not just a big lump of metal sitting out in Pooler. That's something that relates to our city and has related to it for many, many years until it was, nobody knew about it until the whole project started. So let me tell you how the whole project started. The summer of 1944, the people in Chatham County said that they wanted to raise enough money to buy one B-17 bomber and train the whole crew, 10 men. How much do you think they needed to, to buy a whole bomber and train the 10 men? Now, the pilots, it's a year and a half training for each pilot. How much do you think they had to raise to, to do that project? Give me a guess. Exactly, a half a million dollars. <laughs> Boy, are you an economist? Is that what you do? Uh, a half a million dollars. You couldn't pay for the landing gear on a B-52, I think, with, uh, with a half a million dollars. But they went out and they raised half a million dollars. Now, here's how the, the whole project came together. And it's very interesting, because Hunter Army Airfield, people don't quite understand the implication of how important it was. All of the B-17s that went to England in World War II, well, most of them, came through Hunter. And how the process worked was most of the B-17s were built out on the west coast, up in, uh, by Boeing, up in uh, Washington, or down in San Diego, uh, several areas up and down, but they, they were flown to Hunter Field. And many of you have heard of the Women's Air Service, all of these ladies, they just had a big thing about getting buried up in, uh, uh, in Washington. Well, they flew a lot of the airplanes out here. And the final crew training for all of these B-17s took place in Tampa, Florida. In fact, there were so many crashes, they used to say, one a day in Tampa Bay. And, uh, but the ones that made it out of Tampa Bay came here 
to Savannah. So again, people don't realize that what a hub this was. You, you see all these stories about all the B-17s. Well, they all came through Savannah. And what would happen is if every single one of you was the, an aircraft commander, you would all line up tomorrow morning and they'd say, okay, there's 32 of you, there's 32 airplanes. Take the next one in line. And that's how, I mean, I'm simplifying it, but that's how they, they went. It was just an arbitrary decision. Well, when they got the $500,000, they, they implemented it when the 5,000th plane was going to go. 5,000 planes. So the 5,000th plane, they picked one arbitrarily. And uh, now this is not documented. We've read all about the cer There was a lot of ceremonies when the airplanes left. But the, uh, this is the one that when you talk to people that were around then, they always tell the story, but it never made the newspaper. They roll the airplane out the day before, and they get the, now here's how the ceremony is gonna go, and they get all the crew lined up and everything, and Savannah is spelled with one N on the airplane. <laughs> roll that baby out of the way, and they bring in a new one. Somebody lost their job over that. And they, city of Savannah, they paint on the side of the airplane. And uh, they had a big ceremony, and um, there was a lot of, Religious people there, everything went on, and, and the, the, crew, the crew was picked because two of the officers were from Georgia. Uh, one was from uh, Ringgold, Georgia, I believe it's pronounced the pilot, and the uh, navigator was from Tucker, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. So the airplane leaves, and the story leaves Savannah. I'll tell you very quickly what happened. They left here, they, went to New, they stopped in New Hampshire, they went to um, uh, Newfoundland, they went to Reykjavik, Iceland, landed, had an engine failure, and so they left the airplane there. The crew was put on other airplanes, went over to England, uh, reunited, and uh, they were assigned to the 388th Bomb Group. They flew 13 missions, were shot down, and um, this was in March of 45. The war ended in May. They were prisoners for three months, and it was a very difficult three months. The Germans didn't have any food to feed them, and they were forced marching them to use them as hostages, and very, very difficult. Uh, one of them was killed in the, when his parachute didn't open. The other nine made it back, and uh, none of them weighed 100 pounds when they came home. So, and we've, we've sat with the families and, and, and have these stories on tape. So, so that, was, uh, that, that was the city of Savannah leaving here. The airplane got there a... Uh, month after they did, after the crew got there. And this is very interesting. It went to the 484th Bomb Group. And we interviewed several people from that bomb group, and they said at the end of the war, what a statement to American production. They had so many B-17s that if one got shot up, they didn't fix it. They rolled it out of the way and gave the guys a new one. And the B-17 that came here, the city of Savannah, never, it, it, it never got to the front of the line. So the war ended. And when they were sending crews home, what they did was they used these airplanes. They had never flown a mission. The, the original city of Savannah was flown to Connecticut, then flown out to Arizona and scrapped, and, and that was it. And then the whole story of the city of Savannah ended. Nobody knew about it. It was, da -da 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 -da. It was you know, in the Savannah Morning News archives, and, and it was over. Then, ta-da, after the museum is built, after the 8th Air Force Museum is built, um, the word gets around, let's get another, let's get another B-17, and let's call it the city of Savannah. And um, as was mentioned, I was working in the archives at the time, and the, uh, the guy that was running, Walt Brown, a wonderful guy, a medical doctor from Savannah, comes in and he says, uh, didn't you do some project management in your career? I said, oh, yeah. He says, I got a project for you. Who knew? This was more than just a little project. Um, and uh, a long story made short, the last B-17 that the um, Smithsonian Institution had was made available to come down here and be renamed the city of Savannah. And the whole story was going to have to start again. And so when you go out and look at that airplane today, what I'm going to tell you are stories that you can tell people, other people, it's the, city, it's, it, it's the city's history. That half a million bucks. Uh, by the way, that junky old 75-year-old uh, uh, airplane out there, if we wanted to sell it today, would go for 2.5 and it doesn't fly. 2.5 million. It's a little, <laughs> little bit of increase there. With, uh, I was going to ask you how much and see if you guessed that much. But <laughs> uh, so anyway, so the airplane comes here. They, it, it's 
gifted to the, to the museum. And it comes here, and uh, I was the one who was picked from several other, a lawyer, I made sure I brought a, I, 30 years in the government, I would never do anything like that, not bring a lawyer with me. So I go up there with my attorney, and uh, we take uh, possession of the airplane, and Walt Brown, the, the, the man that was running all of this, uh, was terminally ill with cancer at the time. And I had told him that when the airplane belonged to us, I would let him know. And so when, after we signed the paperwork, uh, I said to the guys from the Smithsonian, can I go into the airplane? <laughs> you want it, you know, do whatever you want. So nobody had been in the airplane for 25 years. And it was sitting in a hangar that had, was open at the top. For circulation purposes, they said, well, what it did, it let in pigeons. I opened the door, and the largest guano supply on the East Coast was inside this airplane. And I had, said to, I had said to Walt, I'll call you from the, you know, sitting in the pilot seat. And between me and the pilot seat is about four and a half tons of poop. And I said, geez, I'm, <laughs> I'm going up there. So I, I tread through this thing, big hole where the ball turret used to be. And have to pull a door out of the way. Then I had to get through the bomb bay. And I get into the cockpit. And one of those things, a grace of God, somebody had left a piece of cardboard over the pilot seat. So there was no poop on the pilot seat. But four pound thing that I had to move, move out of the way. And I sat down in the pilot seat and I called, I called Walt on my cell phone and I said, Walt, we got the airplane. And uh, you know, I'd like to say he said some dramatic, oh, Jerry, this is wonderful, like, like that. And he didn't, he was speechless. And then he started to cry. And he said, bring it home. We're all dependent on you. And every, all of us have emotional things in our lives that sneak up on us. Well, this snuck up on me. You know, he, he said, bring it home, we're all dependent on you. And, and he was a guy who was terminally ill, and this was what he wanted. He wanted that airplane and that museum. So uh, uh, I got pretty motivated after that. And we brought the airplane home. Um, we got in contact with the crew. And so we learned some stories on it. with Several uh, families of the crew. And we, uh, um, and we learned some stories. So what I'm going to tell you now, that first I told you about the first airplane, now but I'm going to tell you about the airplane that you'll see when you're going out there now, and the stories that go with it. Now, no, uh, January of 2009, we bring home this airplane, 4483814. That was what it's officially known as in the government. So we bring home the airplane, and in January of 2009, we have three volunteers, myself, Jim Grismer and Marshall Brooks, my, like I said, my attorney. Always, always have yourself defended when you're doing something complicated like this. We had three volunteers. In the time since then till today, 140 people have served as volunteers. Uh, we've get, we get uh, military people that go through. They're here for you know, a couple of years and they leave. Um, we get uh, people that <laughs> get bored. We get people that, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of work that they do, we don't need anymore. So anyway, 140 people have, gone, have signed up and have actually worked on the airplane during that time. When it got home, we had no money, none, zero, nada. Today, we have multiple donors. And, and what has happened, what kept us going over the years was people uh, who are today in their 90s, anybody that flew in the 8th Air Force in World War II, the kids, the guys that were 18 sitting around the guns, they're, they're in their 90s today. And several people along the way heard about the project we were doing and said, how much money do you need? Wow. And they were all, every single one of them was in their 90s and had a lot of money. And probably their great-grandchildren are all cranky that they said that's the money. But anyway, it, it's not that like we're rolling in bucks, but there was enough money there to get the job done. All right. And then here's the thing that we're most proud of. When we sat there, the three of us, and we had to start this project, we said, we don't even know what we don't know. Uh, Jim Grismer and I uh, worked in offices. We were, <laughs> we were executive managers. In no way related to anything that had to do with airplanes. So I think the smartest decision we ever made was we don't know what we don't know. And what happened was we searched around, we called people, and we found a neurosurgeon in Memphis, Tennessee by the name of Harry Friedman. And Harry Friedman uh, was an Air Force officer and uh, has a real interest in uh, airplane restoration because he was the guy that saved the Memphis Bell, the most famous B-17 in the mall. 
He went in there and he actually was paying people to get it going. He, he did such a good job, the Air Force liked it and took the airplane back. Um, but Harry runs a group, there's, in the, there's 47 B-17s left in the world of the thousands that were produced. And um, 39 of them are in the United States. And Harry runs a uh, uh, very informal group of members of each. Some of the airplanes are just sitting there dormant. Others are in uh, uh, very famous museums, and others are under some type of restoration. Some are flying. Anyway, he has a very informal group that um, is, uh, meets every year, and they talk about B-17s in, in, in our culture and, and what, what's left and what our responsibilities are. So he got us started, and the second good decision we made was to talk to him because everybody in the world, now that the, when we got the start of the project, wanted to come and help us. And what he never told us at the time was, of the 39 airplanes in the United States, the 39 B-7s, we were the only group that was not being run by airplane professionals. Three guys that didn't know the front for the back of an airplane. And he said, that's what saved you because we didn't have any egos. <laughs> We just said, we don't know what we don't know. So when people showed up, how Harry saved us was he said, nah, you better work with these people. You better work with these. So we, the first team came in and worked with us. And it, was, it really worked out well. It's only six, eight years. And uh, now people are coming to us. I'll just tell you one thing, a story. Um, how many, I don't know how many of, of you have heard of 3D printing. Well, I had no, I've got a degree in history, 3D printing. What the hell is that? Um, we were the first ones in the restoration business with these planes. When we couldn't, everybody says, well, you can't buy a certain part. Well, it won't be on the airplane. Well, we heard about 3D printing, said somebody loan us one. And Gulfstream and Savannah Tech, again, back in the city of Savannah, Savannah Tech sent us out 20-year-old interns who sit there in front of their computer and look at this part that's over there. The next thing you know, we they, they take their software and take it out to Gulfstream, and 24 hours later, we get a part back. Now, it's not one you could put in a flying airplane, but it's exactly the way it should be. And the test was, we sent them, we only had one uh, control wheel, so we sent them the control wheel, and it came back, including somebody had carved their initials in it, and the initials were still on the side of the... <laughs> so I'm like, whoa, and the guy, some engineer's trying to explain it to me. I said, look, I'm a 70-year-old history teacher, please. This, you don't have to waste your time trying to explain this to me. This doesn't work. So that's where we were, and that's where we are today. But yeah, I, we were going to come in November. That's why it says November. So it's not like we've progressed that much into December. Now, remember I said it was the, the airplane was up in, uh, in, in Virginia. The airplane had been, for all those years, multiple decades, in this hangar, crammed in with other stuff. Do you see what that is behind it? The Space Shuttle Enterprise. And we got there. I got to admit, I really wanted to see the airplane when I got there, but I had to walk over and look at the Enterprise first. You know, that kind of gets you, whoa, you look at that. And uh, we were, by the time we left, we were there a week. By the time we left, there was hardly anything left in that. Uh, our airplane was in the middle, so they had to move everything. And when they were moving it, they said, ah, we'll put it here, we'll put it here. And, and uh, they, they, they were going to refurbish the, um, uh, the hangar, I guess and uh, get rid of all the guano. We wanted, we wanted to sell the guano, corner the guano market and see if we could raise some money. It was, it, it was, uh, it was a stinky place, let me tell you. So anyway, that's the, the first look that we saw of the airplane. And see how it's covered with, with that clear, it's 1984 saran wrap kind of stuff. And we said, oh, this is great, the airplane's been, well, two hours later we realized it wasn't so great, it hadn't protected the airplane. And it took us a year to get it off. A year. Every square inch of the outside of the airplane, guys with little knives, ch -ch 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 -ch, like this. It took us a year to get that stuff off. And uh, it, it did wonders for the metal, but uh, <laughs> who knew? It was, it was uh, um, whatever it is, they don't, uh, the Smithsonian says they don't use it anymore. But when we saw it, we were very impressed that they had covered the airplane with it. And this is the guys working on the airplane. What we had to do. Our, our big decision after we talked to some of the experts was every single bit of the outside and the air, inside of the airplane had to be totally cleaned out. What we had was a tube with four engines sitting on We didn't take the engines off, but we had a tube with four engines hanging on the wings. Nothing inside. Everything was gone. And uh, what you can see in the, in, in the cockpit picture there. And then the, the guys on the left, they're trying to uh, 
clean out uh, all of that stuff that I told you about was stuck to the outside. Then, again, the professionals came in and said, you know what's going to happen? That thing is going to start, even though it's inside, it's going to start corroding. And there's no way you can stop it unless you go through this whole process with anti-corrosion stuff. And uh, um, it was like an environmental nightmare trying to, to work with all of that stuff and, and put it on the airplane and not have it drip on the floor and not have it, have it uh, work with the guys. And we had, to, we had to pay professionals to come in and, and tell us how to do it. We did the, we did the work, but it was uh, taking a 75-year-old uh, aluminum airplane and trying to get all the corrosion out of it and prevent it from happening in the future was something that... Luckily, we also had... We've, we've had a lot of support from the Air National Guard unit here in uh, uh, Savannah and... Uh, they were very, very supportive in, in, in the techniques that we used for that. Then, Tony Hall and Frank Quirk. Tony Hall is a marvelous guy that works out at Gulfstream. And I always said that uh, the Louvre has uh, Rembrandt and um, the Sistine Chapel has uh, Michelangelo and we have Tony Hall. Um, Another environmental nightmare, we had to, the, the inside of the plane, after we put the corrosion stuff on, had to be painted. The planes, when they went over there, they didn't paint anything. They just, uh, in the beginning of the war, they did as camouflage. At the end of the war, they were sending 1,000 airplanes a day. Who was going to hide the airplane? Who cares? You know, they knew they were coming. So they didn't paint anything. It also made the airplane lighter and faster. Interesting. Well, you can see the tube on the right. This is what, after it was all stripped out, and it had to be painted three coats of paint over the corrosion stuff so to, to make the airplane safe from the uh, people going in and, 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 and being exposed to the corrosion materials, but also to seal it in there. So when they came out, the airplane's inside. It's like in a room like this. If you go, when you go out to the museum, it's in a regular room. The airplane had to be totally, totally closed in, and a, something as big as this table was brought over from Gulfstream, placed behind the airplane, and four, we took the, uh, um, there was no tail turret on the airplane, and four big hoses went out of the back of the airplane into this thing, and it cleared the air of all of everything that was churned up when they were painting the inside of the airplane. Again, it, it took, it was an environmental nightmare. It, it took three days just to set it up so that it would be, clean air would come out at the other end, and if it wasn't for Gulfstream, we never, never would have done it. Um, we, we went out, Tony is the, their main guy for doing this stuff, and, and we went out and, uh, um, the idea was he was going to teach one of our guys, or several of our, our guys how to do it, and he said, you know what, it's too hard, I'll do it myself. So we were very, very happy with him. And, and I always do a plug, he paints cars on the outside on weekends, so <laughs> I always throw a plug in for Tony, because he, he's, uh, he's making an extra buck on the side. But it's very important, look at that picture on the right. I'm going to show you another picture of how that looks today, later on. But that was just an open tube. And they, uh, th these guys would work eight hours at Gulfstream and then come in to us and, you know, work from 5.30 at night till 11.30 before they went home. Wonderful guys. Now here's something else. Who knew bombers in World War II, who knew they had wood inside them? Well, the wood, it turns out, we did some research, is cheaper and it was easy to fix when it broke. Metal, when you hit it, where fra uh, shrapnel hit it or something like that, would get all torn up, make more shrapnel, wound people. So they put wood. They could replace it easy. It made splinters. It didn't make shrapnel. So there was wood. In, uh, who knew? It, it, you know, all over the airplanes. Now, um, on the left is the, the total wood package that went in, went to the airplane. On the right is an ammunition box. And this is just because another story to, to tell you. Ammunition boxes, you can see them as they go along there, when they, when they leave on a mission, every gunner would have ammunition boxes stashed by his position. And then as he ran out of a box, he'd, he'd load another one. And each of those boxes holds the, the stream of bullets in there is nine yards long, hence the phrase, the whole nine yards. You know, you've heard that, oh, he gave him the whole nine yards? Well, that was, that was where it came from. If a gunner Really, he gave him the whole nine yards. I always thought it was some distorted football thing or something, but no, nine yards of ammunition in a B-17 in World War II. Now, this gentleman's named Skip Shelton, and he, what a great guy. He was a 19-year-old pilot in World War II. 
Graduated from high school in 1943. Graduated from pilot school in late 1944. So I mean, he'd, right out of high school, next thing you know, he's a bomber pilot. And he was also a fledgling um, artist. And he remained a pilot and an artist for the rest of his life. He became a, com a commercial pilot, um, an, an executive pilot, when he got out of, the, uh, uh, out of the Army after World War II. And he spent most of uh, uh, the time that he was overseas, every time a new plane would show up, he would be the guy that would paint the, the, the uh, artist work on it. And uh, when he was painting our stuff here, uh, one of the uh, TV stations came out and a person who might have been a tad naive said to him, on television, interviewing him, says, well, didn't your, oh, he always said, that on, sometimes they wouldn't send me on missions. I'd be painting airplanes. And, and this woman <laughs> said to him, well, weren't your friends in the military mad that you weren't going on the missions and they had to go while you were painting? And he says, young lady, any day I wasn't getting shot at was a good day. So I just kept painting. So I said, okay. That was, she didn't ask any more questions after that. Um, but he and his wife, who, by the way, was not born when he was flying missions in World War II, and he used to point that out regularly. Um, they said that they would do all of the painting on the airplane exactly, exactly like it was on the original airplane. We're going, oh, how are you going to do that? He said, send us pictures. Okay? We sent them pictures. And what his wife did, when they came, they had um, cutouts of everything that had to be painted. And he uh, um, said, how did, how did you do that? They blew the pictures up and counted the rivets. The letter A in Savannah is four rivets wide and seven rivets high. They counted the rivets. See, you can see the rivets of the airplane there? That's how they did it. Marvelous, marvelous piece of work. And he painted the, 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 both the uh, nose art and the, and the art on the side of the airplane. And what a, he was a charming guy. Really, he died um, several years ago at uh, age 89, and he drove his Harley to work that day. <laughs> My kind of guy. And here's his final artwork on the front of the airplane and in the back. When, and if you look at pictures of the original, it is. It, because he, he measured the rivets. I mean, who, who would have thought of something like that? But, but that's a great story to tell people. I mean, you know, whoa, how did they get that right? Unbelievable. Now, the first thing that we got done to actually say it's restored and it's working was the radio room. Uh, when I was talking to um, Harry Friedman, Dr. Friedman, I said, uh, you know, we've got all this radio equipment up in the archives. And nobody knows anything about it. How do I, you know, what can I do about that? Okay, one question, he says, call the local um, ham operators and then get out of their way. Good advice. We called the, uh, um, oh, I gotta think what it's called now. Uh, at any rate, we called the local ham operators. They came out and they restored all, the radio room is perfect. The pictures and everything, and like this little guy here, um, they bought that off eBay for $400 and spent 12 months putting it together. The big problem, it all works with tubes. Who remembers tubes? <laughs> Nobody even remembers what tubes are, much less you, you got to go and find them. So our radio, our, they broadcast every national holiday. They broadcast from that radio room all over the world. And it was the first thing that was finished. And here's the guy that did it. Guy McDonald, wonderful guy. He's an electrical engineer. And um, the first broadcast, I gotta tell you the story, the first broadcast was from the airplane. So we got him a 50 mission hat with his earphones there and uh, a, uh, you know, an A2 jacket and he's sitting in front of the, the and they were broadcasting to the Miss Liberty, which is a B-17 um, down in Louisiana at Barksdale Air Force Base. And it was so hot that day, they had to be outside. It was too, too hot for them to stay in the airplane. But when they did it, they, we made, we made a big deal about it. The TV stations come out, and WTOC has a camera in one side, and WSAV has a camera in the other side. So I was in the room, and I'm, I'm huddled in the bottom so that nobody will see me. And, and this is going to be so neat. Oh, and he's got to broadcast. So guy, he says, wait a second, Jerry, before we get started. And he takes out his iPhone and texts the guys down in Louisiana. I said, you can't text. You know, I want to hear Roger Wilco, you know, what? this is ridiculous. But he, he texts them, they text the back, okay, we're ready to go. And then they did something that, you know, that, that appeared on television. Uh, but it, it was taking technology from this day with 75-year-old technology. It was, it was quite a day, quite a day. 
Now, one of the things we're going to talk about, and you can t tell stories about this, is we are going to have, we, we will very shortly have, the only B-17 in the world with three operating power turrets that can be shown to the public and will be shown to the public. Um, how they are put together was a marvelous, marvelous ability of local engineers and, and craftsmen to construct them from almost literally nothing. On the left is our tail turret, by the way, we, the airplane came without a tail turret. The, uh, the tail turret that was on the airplane is in the Smithsonian um, Natural History, uh, American History Museum as a, in, a, in an exhibit for Rosie the Riveters. And it shows two different Rosies working on the, uh, with the turret. So we had, to get, we had to get a new turret. And on the left is one, that is the only turret that we could, we could get. It came out of a fire bomber, a B-17 fire bomber that crashed 45 years ago in Alaska. And what we needed was a template to make parts. And that was delivered to us, and then on the right is what it looks like today. It's absolutely perfect inside and out. And the, uh, um, what we did was we took one brace out of the old turret and put it in, in this one so we can say the turret has a history. But the whole thing was built out in Pooler by uh, uh, engineers and craftsmen from uh, Gulfstream. Marvelous, marvelous piece of work. Now this, the top turret story, none of, none, nobody else uses top turrets because it's too, B-17s were built to have 19-year-old skinny guys crawling around inside. Well, none of us are 19 nor skinny. And, uh, but we said we are going to have a upper working turret, which nobody does. Again, because it takes up too much space in the airplane. And, um, but we had to find the parts. It would have cost $250,000 to have those parts machined. What we found out up in Aurora, Ohio, this was at a museum outside. They had no use for it because they were a naval air museum. And it was a planter for 30 years, a planter. And uh, $250,000, it would have, Cost us. So anyway, one of the, it, it turns out it was a mile and a half from one of the guys where, where his mother lived. <laughs> Go see mom real fast. <laughs> and uh, they, they were one, he went out and talked to them, wonderful people, and they, uh, not, they didn't sell it to us, they gave it to us. Wonderful, wonderful uh, thing. And, and the reason that we are going to have three working power turrets is because these people were so generous to us. And it took, well, three and a half years of work to actually get it, it's almost ready to function. I mean, it's functional now, but not totally put together, and, and, and some parts are being made out at Gulfstream, but it's almost ready to go. And uh, we, we get a picture, a kick out of this. The guy on the left made all of the windows, restored the top, and uh, he is a, uh, was a 35-year uh, master sergeant out at, uh, um, th with the Air National Guard here in, in Savannah, and the guy on the right doing the dirty work scrubbing, he's got a PhD in aerospace science. <laughs> so he, he wanted to work somewhere, and we got a job for you, you know? So uh, uh, Mort Glick, his name is, but he did a wonderful job on getting the stanchions totally restored. And then here it is today. There, there's the stanchions. They're, they're mounted in the airplane, and, and you can see the cap is put on on the left, and we're just months away from this being uh, the last functioning uh, power turret on the airplane. Now this is, this is a great story. Um, the guy in the middle, Bud, Bud Porter, was a 19-year-old gunner, ball turret gunner, in World War II in the 95th Bomb Group. And uh, he is one of the last two people serving on the board out at the museum that actually um, were World War II 8th uh, Air Force veterans. And the other two guys are uh, both engineers, guy on the left, Tommy Garcia, is a consultant to us, and um, guy on the right um, is, is an engineer that works with us. Uh, and what happened was we found out that there's a Hollywood company out in California that they had done the, um, uh, the Memphis Bell, the movie, and they had the ball turret, the bottom turret that protected the bottom of the airplane left over from the movie. And these two guys went out, talked to them, we negotiated, and we bought the turret, as is. But they couldn't resist. See the 
the, see the, uh, the, the gun barrels there? They got two pieces of uh, plastic drilled holes in them so they looked like gun barrels and put it in and drove 3,000 miles across the country. They said they bet 45 cop cars were chasing them at one time or another. They said, what the hell do you have on the back of that, uh, that truck? But we, we got that totally complete turret and, and in, inoperable. It had been sitting for years and years and years, but it's fixed and I'll show you what, what happened to it and, and it, it's going, in, it's in the airplane now and functioning. That was the day on the left, that was every single part that we had manufactured or taken out and remanufactured that was about to go into the turret. And uh, we built the thing on the right, we called it the gallows, and, uh, and hung the turret and, and, and mounted all the parts in it. Um, but it's even, oh, let me show you right here. Oh, wait a second. Right here, you can see little designs in the movie. I don't remember from the movie, but apparently in the movie, the ball turret gunner was the ladies' man of the crew. And he had pinup pictures on here. And they were still on there. So we put preservative on them, so they'll always be on the, the pictures that were in the movie will always be on the, uh, um, uh, will always be on the ammunition cans there. Now, in the nose, the airplane had a, it's, it's history, I forgot to tell you it's history, after, after it was manufactured, it went and s sat up in North Dakota for two years in front of a high school. Um, local B-17 pilots had bought it, $350 they bought it for. Threw it, brought it up there, left it there. Somebody offered the, the uh, uh, illegally offered the um, school district $5,000 for the airplane, and that airplane was gone the next day. They said, we'll, we'll take the hit, whatever legal it is. It went up to Canada, spent 20 years flying all over the world doing mapping. And they completely rebuilt the nose of the airplane, which killed us. But they completely rebuilt the nose of the airplane, big, big uh, cameras, and they would do mapping. They went all, all over. And then it spent 10 years as a fire bomber, and then 25 years uh, in storage before we got it. But anyway, we had to completely rebuild the nose because it, it, none of the stuff that we needed to put in there, a nose turret and everything, nothing would fit. So that's on the left, that's what, uh, when they were just putting it back together, and then on the right, this is the finished, uh, the finished nose. And, and see, you can see the letters and, and how, how it came out and everything like that. Just amazing, uh, the work. But, and and uh, that's a brand new, whoops, that's a brand new, um, uh, nose piece that we had to have manufactured because there just wasn't, wasn't anyone around. And we traded that nose piece for some tires, I'll show you later. This, this is just a, an example I put in here to show you the technology, the, 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 the minute, excellent, superb work that they, they did. We put a hole, the workers, not me, put in a whole oxygen system. Nobody is ever going to see the oxygen system, but we wanted to say the airplane was complete. So they, this is the, the diagram that we got from uh, Boeing. And over here, every station, 10 times in the airplane, every station has one of these. And that's the uh, oxygen flow in, and then uh, the gauges. And then this is a, called a bailout bottle. The plane got hit, and they had to jump. If you hit 25,000 feet, there's no oxygen. So not only did they have to get their parachutes on and everything, they had to take this with them, hook it up to their oxygen mask, and jump. And uh, so, but they, it's installed in every place, every position for the men in the airplane. And that's over here that shows how complicated it is. We didn't have to do that. The guys said, we can do it. So they did it. It was wonderful. Remember the tube I showed you before? Well, this is what the tube looks like today. And that's why we can't have people prancing through the airplane all the time. Uh, it's the waste gunner's positions. There's gun here, gun here. Those are the uh, nine yard, ammunition boxes, that's the ball turret, and those are the two ammunition cans with the uh, pinup pictures on them. And there's even a bag, a canvas bag made down here with the, uh, uh, the shell casings would fall down uh, um, after the gunner you know, was firing the gun. There's oxygen on the top of the ball turret, and then in front of that is the um, radio room. Uh, and then the floors are exactly like they were built into the original airplane. So the, the, Technology, the, the, the technical work inside the airplane is superb. And one of the things we plan to do is to show that off to people. This shows you what the cockpit looked like when, after we stripped the airplane. Um, you can see 
See the different the different textures of the of, of the airplane. This one this one with this wheel was made by uh, um, Gulfstream, and uh, this is one the, the original one on the airplane. But this is what the cockpit looks like today. Now, the last two things that we had to do as big purchases um, came out. One became a trade. Right, right over here we have knobby tires. No big deal, except for they were made in 1945. <laughs> Where do you find knobby tires? We had real ones that could work on an airplane flying. Air. We traded with a flying B-17, and they had these sitting in the back somewhere, and they gave them to us. We gave them real tires that they could use on the airplane today, and they also had that uh, nose piece made for us. And then this, another Hollywood thing. Look at this, it's a 500 pound bomb that went in the airplane, it's made of plastic. It doesn't weigh 500 pounds, it's made of plastic. But it's exactly as they were in 1945. Who would say they could make that? Hollywood. So we, we have a whole stock full of bombs that we can, uh, we can use for that. Now, what's gonna make us special? We have, com we have a completed interior and we're gonna present it to the public with state-of-the-art technology. Um, it's going to be a little bit in the future, but you saw all that work there. There's no way that we have to, we could spend a half a million dollars and do all that work and nobody sees it. And you can't have people walking through it. It's just too difficult. And, and the, the few remaining veterans that come back, they can't get in the airplane. So we've got a state-of-the-art plan put together by the radio room guy, the electrical engineer, which will show off every bit of the interior to the outside. And then we're going to have three operating turrets that we're going to demonstrate to the public. Of all the B-17s left in the world, some of them claim that their turrets work, but they don't show you. We're going to have it. So you can tell people that they can come to the city of Savannah and see the city of Savannah. Got to go out to pool there. But, and they, we will have, in the future, three working power turrets. Uh, and it will be the only, the, the only B-17 in the world that will have them. So there it is today. A, a whole lot different than when I first saw it up in uh, uh, with the guano all over the place up in, in uh, Virginia. So I've told you a whole bunch of stories about the airplane. I'm going to tell you two more because they're in, in, in my closure, because they're very, very important to us. The one is that we realized there was more to this story than bringing out the glory of the men that fought in World War II. And the other one is Always leave them laughing. You gotta, you gotta leave with a, people come in and tell us stories constantly. In the book, I have a whole chapter on just the stories that people told us. So let me tell you these two final stories for you to take with you. In the first one, a guy by the name of David Pinniger, who's been with us since the very beginning, is working on the airplane one afternoon, and a very small, frail woman in her 70s comes up to him and with a very heavy accent. She says, uh, is this a, a bomber like they bombed Germany with? And he says, yes. And she says, does this airplane bomb Germany? And he said, no. Um, this was built after the war was finished. And she said, when I was three years old, I lived in Frankfurt. And when the planes came over, it scared us all terribly. And I can never forget. And she turned around and walked away. And he came in and told the story to us in the shop. And it's the only time that nobody had any reaction. Nobody could say anything. Nobody thought, we always talked about the, 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 the glory of the young guys that were, and the, the fight. We, we had never thought about the innocent little girls that were three years old. And one of the things when we started talking, one of the guys said something very important. He said, I was three years old in 1945. It was a very, very moving moment for us. And, uh, you know, we had to sit back and kind of say, whoa, you know, that's, uh, thank God we were sitting here wherever we were. And, and most of the guys in that room were the same thing. We were two, three, four, five years old when that lady was there. Now, let me tell you one final story. And uh, particularly those of you who have, have served or, or, are friend, or, or aware of the military, you'll get a kick out of this. Um, anybody that shows up at the museum who's a World War II veteran gets a special thing to wear, and they don't have to charge. You know, we don't charge them to get in. And when they get to the airplane, particularly 8th Air Force guys, it's your airplane. What do you want? You know, we'll, we'll do whatever you want. So I'm sitting there in the office one day, and a guy comes in, one of the guys comes in, and he says, there's a guy outside, says he's a, a, a World War II 8th Air Force radio operator, and he wants to see the radio room. I said, okay. He says, yeah, but he's not wearing one of those 
uh, things around his neck. And I, I don't know, I don't know what to do. So I go out and I talk to the guy, and the guy says, oh yeah, come on, let me see the radio room and everything. So uh, I take him into the radio room. And he obviously knows what he's talking about. He sits down, he says, oh, you got it right. Oh boy, this is neat, look what you did here. Well, you know, um, and he's, he's talking about where the gun was and everything, and he's talking, he, he knows his stuff. So we, we have a conversation, and we're getting up to leave, and I have a, 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 a form that we have all veterans fill out when they come in. I said, gee, could you, could you fill out this form, please, you know, before you leave? And he goes, ah, I'd rather not. So he gets out of the airplane, and he's walking away, and the guy with me is looking, gee, that's kind of weird. And the guy turns around, and he comes back. And he says, I know you're what you're thinking. Why, why wouldn't I sign that thing? He says, let me tell you my story. He w he graduated from high school in 44, went to radio operator training, graduated and, and, and was sent to England in early 1945. Remember I told you they had so many airplanes, they didn't need more airplanes. So he was sent not on a crew, but with a whole bunch of guys on a ship. So they get there, they're not attached to anybody, nobody knows them. He gets sent to some bomb group, which you didn't tell me about, and uh, he's got no crew, nobody knows him, so they assign him as a standby radio man, and when the, and an airplane leaves and there's a radio man that can't get on the airplane, uh, he goes and substitutes for them. So he flies two missions. On the second mission, something happens, which he doesn't make deal, uh, any deal of. He gets into an argument with the pilot. He ends up getting court-martialed, busted to private, and they take him off flight status. Well, he doesn't know the war's going to end in three months. So he's taken off flight status. This is wonderful. He's like, I don't care. You know, I'm not going to get shot at this. I don't care if I'm a private. You know, wait till the war's over. So he's sweeping hangers. That's his job. He's sweeping hangers. The war ends. They start sending guys home. And every day, an airplane leaves and goes back to the United States. And the seven senior ground crew go on the plane. So he says, I started to do the math. He said, I was going to be the last guy on the base. I was going to lock the door. Nobody cared about him. He was uh, disgraced. He was uh, a private. He's sweeping the hangars. So he looks at the planes going back, and one of them's going to uh, Boston, his hometown. So he goes and he talks to the pilot. And the pilot says, I understand, son. He says, here's the deal. I never go aft of the cockpit. If you're on the airplane when it leaves, I could care less. Talk to Sergeant so-and-so. You know how the military works. So he goes and talks to Sergeant so-and-so. And as he says, some money exchanged hands. And when the airplane leaves, he's in the back. So they land in Boston, gets his duffel bag. Thanks, guys. Goes, gets in a cab and goes home. His parents answer the door. Like, they can't believe it. So he goes inside and he says, and the next day, I went and got a social security card and went to work with my father and worked for that business for 69, 68 years. And, I, and I'm trying to process this, and he says, and I never got in touch with the Army again. I've been AWOL for 69 years. <laughs> and the guy that was with me turns out and looks at me, do you think that's BS? I said, who cares? What a great story it is. <laughs> and and I, you can tell it wasn't the first time that he had told the story either, but it was, uh, I, 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 I used that as an example at the end to, to say, you know, there's a million stories attached. To, to all these airplanes. And I want you to think of the airplane out there, not as a piece of metal, but of a, a, as a million stories. And, and uh, um, it was, what a, an honor it was to be part of this, particularly when these guys would come in. And uh, we spoke, the last time that I spoke uh, to a group out there, it was, to, uh, excuse me, the, when I spoke to this group out there, it was the last time the 8th Air Force Association was going to have their World War II um, group here. And without even thinking off the top of my head, I said, this is an honor because we're your children and your grandchildren. Well, oh, whoa. They, that really hit the number. And I didn't even think, like, I'll think something dramatic to say. But, and we were. Every single one of us are either the child or the grandchild of, a, uh, of, of somebody that did this. And so um, that's our story. And I hope that you will, as City of Savannah people, relate to the City of Savannah out there. And... Uh, um, and we'll go from there. Is there any questions? Where did you all work? Where was it restored at? Excuse me? Where was it restored at? How far? Where else in Savannah were you put together? Um, it was, we, we arrived at the museum, and it was on four trucks. And um, they rolled, rolled it into the, they rolled the fuselage into the museum. And then everything else came in as needed. And uh, um, it was a crew of retired Navy NCOs that did it. 
and they're, they're very, very well known. And uh, it was the first B-17 they ever did, so they were very excited about it. Uh, but they took it apart up in Virginia, came down in four trucks. I tell you, an interesting thing, I never would have thought of this, every state that we went through, from Virginia to Georgia, had to give every truck a license. And we hired some guy, and it was $10,000 to get them, I said, everybody, $10,000 to get the, it, it was 100, it would have been worth it. <laughs> what a nightmare. And, and, but every truck needed a, a license for every single state, and in two states, North Carolina and South Carolina, the trucks had to get off because of bridges. And that was four pages of paperwork right there. But when they got there, they, they put the fuselage inside and then just brought everything up, the wings, everything in one at a time and put it all together. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed coming here. <laughs> nice to talk to the city of Savannah.
Jim Grisman's daughter Jane has any stories from Jim. Not that we have time for them, I guess. They're all in this book. <laughs> so Jerry's book um, is available when we're done with the program for anybody who wants to purchase it. And all the proceeds are going to go to benefit the ongoing maintenance of the B-17. And I'm sure he'd be more than happy to sign it for you. So see him at the end if you would um, are interested in that. Um, so we're going to switch gears now. And we're going to um, do a really, really short uh, little program introducing you to George Hannum. And then we'll walk over across the hall to look at the little exhibit for those of you who can stay just a few minutes. Um, if you aren't familiar with George Gannum, I just wanted to take a little bit to talk about him as we approach the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So, so George Karen Gannum grew up in Savannah. He graduated from Benedictine Military School in 1938. In 1939, he joined the United States Army Air Corps and he was soon stationed with the 17th Squadron, 18th Air Base Group at Wheeler Field in Hawaii. He rose to the rank of Staff Sergeant and worked in communications. He qualified at, um, to be an Army Aviation Cadet and he was scheduled to depart for training um, and it was scheduled to do that, um, but unfortunately the Japanese attacks on Hawaii um, happened before he was supposed to leave. On December 7, 1941, he was on temporary assignment at Hickam Field when those attacks happened. Um, George Gannon was killed in action while he was trying to secure military aircraft during the Japanese raids. Um, after Pearl Harbor, Gannon was recognized not only locally, but in regional, Catholic, Syrian American, and even national publications for his um, actions during those attacks. His remains are buried in the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific in Hawaii, which is commonly referred to as the Punch Bowl. Um, but there's also a memorial grave marker in our own cemetery here at Bonaventure. George Gannum is um, recognized as Savannah's first World War II casualty. Um, there's a proclamation that I have a copy here that was passed at the last city council meeting by our mayor and council. It proclaims um, December 7, 2016, as George K. Gannum Day here in Savannah. That is Pearl Harbor Day, but this year we're going to celebrate it also as George K. Gannum Day. That is to raise awareness of Gannum sacrifices, um, but also of all our World War II casualties from Savannah and all of the World War II veterans that um, fought in, in World War II and then came back. Following his death, George's family received his personal effects back from Hawaii, so those things that he left in his footlocker and didn't come back for. Um, for years, his mother saved these items, along with mementos from his childhood and other items that represented George's personal life and his military career. After George's parents passed, this collection was maintained by his younger brother, Michael. And then after Michael passed, um, by his son, um, George's nephew, Jeff. Joe donated this collection to the city's municipal archives last year um, after determining it was time to find an appropriate home where the collection would be preserved and accessible to the public for future generations. Um, so it's now the city's responsibility to make sure that these items are available um, for many years to come. The collection includes items that reflect George as a student at Benedictine, as a young man growing up in Savannah, records that trace his enlistment in the United States Army Air Corps and rise to the rank of Staff Sergeant, um, records um, that reflect his training communications and desire to be a pilot, correspondence with Bishop O'Hara and artifacts that reflect his strong Catholic faith, as well as memorials that came, in the, to the community, came from the community to his family after his death. Um, for me, the items that touched me most were his box camera and photographs. George was an avid amateur photographer and his photographs include those that um, he took in the 1930s that reflect the savannah he grew up in. Um, as well as images from his journey to Hawaii and those of carefree times in Hawaii before the attacks. Um, and also for me, one of the most important pieces was a flag that the city, through Mayor Gamble, presented on the first anniversary of Pearl Harbor to its family. And so the family kept that flag for 74 years and it's now um, part of this collection. Um, Megan Kirkhoff, sitting right there, processed the collection and she prepared the physical exhibit and Kelly um, Zakovic, another archivist with us, prepared the online exhibit. And I was just going to ask them to say what, to them, was the most interesting or touching pieces in the exhibit. Or um, I should say in the collection. Um, well, for me, when I was going through the collection, I found um, his financial notebook where he kept his records, um, his everything that he bought and he wrote down. And two days before he So when I saw that, it was pretty connected to how close it was to 
Kelly. Um, so of course there's a lot of his military history, but then also he was a 22-year-old <coughs> young man living in Hawaii. Um, so like his bathing suit is in the collection. There's photographs from like attending a <coughs> luau. So you kind of get both sides um, of life during the war. <laughs> yeah, and you can see some of those pictures here. So I think one thing all of us can agree on that um, he was a handsome and vibrant young man, and he really cut down in the prime of his youth. He was only 22 years old when um, when he died. Um, the and here. Um, you know, the picture in the middle, he's on a ship. The picture on the right, he is in Hawaii. And there's some very playful pictures with him and some other soldiers that you'll see in the exhibits. Um, the George Karam Gannam collection is now open to the public for research through the library and archives here at City Hall. Um, there's a handout on the corner which has all the, um, the, the URLs. But our full finding aid and inventory, that's the, the guide to the collection, is available on our website. So you can see what is in the collection before you come in to use it, or if you want to tell other people about that. Um, and then in honor of the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor and of the loss of George Gannam, we've created two exhibits. One, the physical exhibit, which we'll go see, and then one, the virtual exhibit. Um, the physical exhibit is going to be on display through the end of 2017. The virtual exhibit will be up indefinitely. Um, and they both sort of follow the same th big themes of George's Benedictine career, um, his photography, Catholicism, his military career, death, his death, and then the memorialization of George after Pearl Harbor. But since they were curated by two different archivists, they have two different viewpoints. And while they both chose some of the same items, they also chose different items. So I recommend you look at both to get a full picture of George and of the collection. Um, and so um, I guess, Doug, you weren't able to get our 1938 classmate with us today. But there are some classmates of him. Do you want to say anything about well, that? Well, yeah. Uh, George Kirby Griffin, Jr. was classmate in 1938. And he went with us yesterday for the Pearl Harbor members of the 8th Air Force Museum. And uh, I didn't think there was room left in this group, so I didn't call him to come. So I did at about 11 o'clock and I left the voicemail. And he called me back at uh, 10 minutes to 12. And, and uh, I, I'm sorry, 10 minutes after 12. And so he just came in from the yard working. He wasn't dressed. He didn't he'd get down here. And I said, I'm sure Jerry would be talking a while. Because he, uh, he, he just had to pass. But he, his remembrance that he said yesterday was, uh, I asked him, because uh, I drove him out there to the Air Force, I said, Herbie, I was told, because I spoke at the BC ceremony in, I think, 2007 on Gannon Day, and then getting ready for that, I talked to Joe Gannon, a uh, fellow lawyer, his dad was a lawyer, uh, the nephew, and I said, uh, I was getting gathered information about my talk, and it appears that no one disagrees with the statement that George Gannon never, growing up, time he left for the Army Air Corps, never said a profane word in his life. Not one. He still, so he still didn't curse. That's just remarkable to me for a young man. Very <laughs> uh, restraint. But Herbie said he was a very quiet, reserved individual. He was the editor of the Quill, the BC newspaper, and I've seen some copies of those. And Herbie's going to bring me some and uh, share those with me. I haven't seen all of them. But apparently he was quite a, a different individual that took his life seriously, not himself too seriously. He had fun, uh, but he did so in a wholesome, wholesome manner, uh, which I think is representative of that age group too. Thank you. Yeah, one thing, just to hear. Ward on Wednesday at 9, 15, <laughs> hour ceremony, but uh, it's interesting about Benedictine and his classmates, Korea, 29 other cadets in BC were killed during World War II. And the school at that time was only about 52. Over that period of time, so a remarkable group of young men and uh, sacrificed a lot for us. So the board on Wednesday at 914 up to the BC cafeteria. In the so just could you just explain what you're doing? So every year you have Danum Day. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, they, don't, they don't know who you are. No, <laughs> Colonel Rossi, the uh, senior army instructor Benedict, and my boys went there and traveled down to BC. But we do a lot of ceremonies in Savannah. This is probably the best ceremony we do. It's 
only outside but this year because of the weather. I'm moving inside and uh, Mr. Griffin will be there. Mr. Gavin's his family will be there. But uh, the start of George Penn and the 29 of the cadets will ring the bell 30 times for the cadets killed in World War II. And then one cadet will receive a Gamma Day medal this year at Sam Jones, a sophomore staff sergeant at Sam Jones. Sam Rank has a George K. Penn. So the board on Wednesday, uh, Thanks for inviting me. If I know this, I would want some more cadets. <laughs> Let me say one other thing that I've learned through the process, correct me if I'm wrong, There were some cadets who just quit school and went in. They dropped out of school uh, to go into the military, and then they came back and finished after the war. They finished their high school education. Um, and I might also mention um, Doug is a member of American Legion Post 184, which is named for George Gannon. So there are, are after the war, um, George has been remembered in many ways. I also like to think that George is sort of a symbol for everybody that was lost in World War II. He was the first, but he wasn't the last. Over 400 um, people from Chatham County were lost during World War II, and they are, their Five names. 527. How much? 527. 527 are, um, are on the World War II monument. I should have that number emblazoned <laughs> in my brain, having worked on that project. But this, this lady spent more time helping us get the World War II memorial on River Street done and done properly uh, with respect to the facts because she dug them out and helped us get all the names together. A tremendous amount of research. And I thank you for that. Well done. Uh, I say between that project and this project, those are two of the most important projects I've done with the city. But let's go across the hall and look at George's thing. And then also, please follow up with Jerry if you'd like a copy of his book, because I think that would be a great Christmas present. Thank you. Thank you.